guys are such quiet wavers. Okay, so I think I'm supposed to dismiss the elementary kids and the youth. And uh, as they head out, I'll just embarrass them and say, I think the youth did a great job leading us this morning in worship. <clears throat> Getting better every week, I would say. So bless, uh, bless their hearts. Hey, it is uh, exciting to see you guys this morning. I'm so looking forward to our time of baptisms afterward. And as Susie mentioned, um, Poor Susie, she does a great job up here with no information from me. So every Sunday she comes and she says, what's going on? And I say, I don't even know either. But she does a great job trying to keep everybody up to date on how this, uh, this train is speeding down the tracks. But um, if you are interested in being baptized but you haven't told us, um, it's not too late. So as we head out, we're going to head out for the baptisms right uh, after the teaching. We're not going to have a closing song. That'll kind of be our closing song out there, if you will. But if you're interested in being baptized, um, on the way out, Susie will be standing out there at the info table, and you can just grab her and say, I want to be baptized, and she'll get you over in the line. So again, um, we'll talk about it out there, but baptism is simply an outward statement of an inward change. Uh, that change has already happened in your heart. You've been born again. You've asked the Lord Jesus to be your Savior and to forgive you of your sins. And now you're simply declaring that uh, to the world. So uh, excited for that. And also some of the things that are happening, I do promise you small group announcement is coming right up. Probably we'll, uh, we'll pre-announce it in the e-bulletin this Wednesday. I hope to have all the groups finalized by then and be able to get the information out and start some signups. So if you don't get that e-bulletin, here's a reason to sign up. And I think there's a sign up right on the website, or you can just simply send an email to info at ccmv.org, and we'll add you right into that. So um, we'll announce small groups next week. We'll have signups next week here at church, and then um, they'll start up probably the week of the 12th, that following week. And they'll run uh, right up just until uh, Thanksgiving time. So a great short session of small groups and a good opportunity kind of to get uh, plugged in. So with that, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 15 this week. Uh, one more quick reminder. I have loved getting these uh, info cards and the prayer request cards as you guys have been dropping them in the box out there. As I've said, we are going to pray for you every week, whether you like it or not. So you might as well tell us if you have specific needs and different things that you're seeking the Lord about for yourself that we can partner with you uh, in prayer for. So let's pray and just ask that the Lord would really bless our time of teaching this morning. He's already blessed our time of worship, but we want to ask specifically as we go to the word. So Father, we do thank you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to study it, Lord, the, the, real, the privilege that we have, Lord, of just gathering together here openly to, uh, to be taught by you, Lord, and to be uh, ministered to. Father, we pray that our, uh, our time of worship this morning was a blessing to you, Lord. We thank you that you do promise to inhabit the praises of your people. And now we pray, Lord, as we pray each and every week, we pray that that teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest here this morning and that you would um, just give us ears to hear what you would say to your church, Lord, uh, what you would say to us individually and what you would say to us corporately. And we ask your blessing on your word in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So picking up this morning in Revelation chapter 15, as we work our way through this entire book, um, you know, if it seems like we have kind of been a little bit stopped for months now at the same spot, it's because we have, right? Just chapters 10 through 14, we've kind of been paused in the middle of what we've been calling this parenthetical passage, right? Right here sort of stopped at the midpoint of the tribulation as the Lord, you know, uses these, you know, these chapters um, speaking through the Spirit, speaking through the Apostle John, really to let us in on some information that the Spirit believes we need to know to help with our understanding of all of these events that we are witnessing. Primarily, 
we've seen that happen in chapters 10 through 14 as we've been introduced to and as we've really looked at some of these key characters in this end times scenario. And very quickly, remember, we looked at Israel and her male child, Jesus Christ. We looked at the Antichrist. We looked at Satan, who will both empower the Antichrist. We looked at the two witnesses who will oppose the Antichrist. We looked at the temple, which we said will be rebuilt in Jerusalem during this time. We looked at abominations. We looked at desolations, which are going to happen there in the temple. We looked at the false prophet. We've seen angels. We've seen other heavenly creatures and looked at struggles and marks and battles, right? And all of this in kind of this panoramic view as we really previewed how these details will unfold at the end of human history. And this morning, with chapter 15, we sort of rewind the tape. I guess I just dated myself. We skip backward in the file, or, or whatever you do now without a tape. But we pick up the action now, right precisely where we last left off chronologically, at the end of chapter 9. Remember at the end of chapter 9, we had the sounding of the sixth trumpet, which completed that second of three sets of these judgments that the Lord is going to be pouring out upon the world. Remember, we started with the seal judgments, which then gave way to the trumpet judgments, which will finally now give way to the bowl judgments, which we're going to begin in our text today. And boy, does it seem like we are ready to get this kind of show back on the road, so to speak, right? But, you knew there was a but coming, right? But before we do, what we're going to see in our text today is another slight pause. But this is a very important pause of preparation in heaven before we see all of the things that are about to happen on the earth. And you remember we've seen a similar pause before each set of those other two sets of the judgments. Remember in chapter 5, there was a pause as the lamb first took up that sealed scroll before the seal judgments. And then again in chapter 8, remember we read that there was silence in heaven for a full half an hour as the angels were given their trumpets before sounding them for the trumpet judgments. And I think that what we're going to see is that our pause this morning is similarly set here very strategically and that it is very much a pause with a purpose. Because without this well-placed pause here in chapter 15, we might find it hard to watch and to witness what is about to happen in chapter 16 through 19. And in fact, I think it's only with a very clear understanding of Revelation chapter 15, it's just eight verses. Most people just tag it on as they head into chapter 16. But I think it's important enough, I think it's placed here purposely, because I think that a right understanding of chapter 15 really helps us from thinking that God is unfair as we look at what's about to happen in chapter 16 through 19. Because the very next thing that John sees, we pick up here in our text, this series of different signs that are being given to him by the Lord. We're going to see a sign of judgment. Look at verse 1 of Revelation chapter 15. John writes, he says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So what John saw, right, it was awesome. It was impressive to him. He says it was great and it was marvelous. Not marvelous as we use it in the sense of something that's fantastic, you know, something that's necessarily good. But marvelous in the sense of something to be marveled over, right? He saw these seven angels with the seven plagues of the wrath of God. And these are the seven last plagues. They're God's final judgment on a disobedient and wicked world. And with them, we're going to see God pour out his wrath fully and pour out his wrath finally on the world that rebelled against him and then rejected his payment for their sin. Now, the idea of the wrath of God being finally complete is an important one. And in a sense... 
it means that the, these judgments with them are going to come no more judgments. They're the last ones. They complete the set. But it also has the sense, biblically, that these judgments come because God just can't take it anymore. Now, interestingly, in the Greek, there are two different words that are used for wrath when it talks about the wrath of God. One is orge, right? And it's anger from a settled disposition. Right? which is the more common word that's used in the New Testament when it talks about God's anger towards sinful humanity. God doesn't like it the way that his creatures have rebelled against him and destroyed themselves in the process. But it's a settled anger. It's a, a measured anger. But then there's another Greek word used for God's wrath. It's the word thymos. And it describes something very different. It describes more of a volatile, a passionate anger. It has the idea almost of an outburst of anger, not necessarily the losing of one's temper like we might do, but it means business, right? And that's the word that's used here. In fact, that word is only used 11 times total in the New Testament, and 10 of those times are right here in the book of Revelation. Because this is the time when God's settled anger finally flashes forth and it flashes hot. But it also flashes with a purpose. Because that word for complete means to reach an end or an aim. So the sense is that even with this hot wrath of God, it will fulfill his eternal purposes. God isn't just blowing off steam. He's not just losing his temper and lashing out, right? But it is God saying, look, I've been patient with human rebellion and depravity, and now this wickedness of man has reached the point where I am forced to do something about it. Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 15 when God first made that covenant with Abraham? And in it, he said this, starting in verse 13 of Genesis 15, it says, Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. So speaking of that coming captivity in Egypt. It says, And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. So that speaks of the exodus then from Egypt. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good age. But in the fourth generation, he says, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In other words... While Israel was being held there captive, captive in Egypt for 400 years, God was giving the Amorites, right? This is one of those wicked pagan peoples who was inhabiting that land, which ultimately God intended to give to the Israelites. But God was giving them an opportunity to repent and to turn to him. Now, tragically, we know, historically, they never did. And so by the time Joshua gets to the land, Deuteronomy chapter 20, as they're entering in, this is what God has to command Joshua. It says, of the cities of these people, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. And it's verses like this that can be a little hard to hear. But the point is that these kinds of verses only seem unfair and only seem brutal when one fails to take into account that God waited for hundred years for these same Amorites and all of the other ites also, he waited 400 years for them to turn from the horrific perversion and the incredible cruelty that defined those cultures and destroyed 
the souls of those people. 400 years is a long time, right? It's twice as long, roughly, as our nation has existed here. That whole time that Israel was being held captive in Egypt, God was waiting for the Amorites to turn from their bizarre, evil practices, but they didn't. And so finally, when that terrible iniquity was complete or full, right, God said, enough is enough. So did he do so because he's cruel? Well, not at all. Because the Amorites were already doomed. They were already damned. They were a lost, gone people. You think about the incredible sexual perversion. You think about the wicked, demonic, religious, pagan religious practices, which included the live sacrifices of their own children, which they would place on these white, hot, stone, burning altars to these false pagan gods, and they would beat drums as loudly as they could simply to drown out the screams of these tortured infants. And the truth is, they were so sick that when God finally ordered their annihilation, God was simply putting them out of their misery. Now, I know that we're taking a bit of time on this point, and the reason is because the people who read the Bible only casually, or people who hear a story in a Sunday sermon occasionally, they can very easily think that God is a cruel God. But for those of us who understand the Bible, we need to understand and we need to be able to explain to them how patient God truly is. We need to be able to help them to understand that we can't mistake the patience of God for impotence or apathy or approval of the sin of people because although the wheels of God's judgment may turn slowly, right, they do indeed grind thoroughly. And so with these seven angels and their seven plagues, the wicked world now is about to finally drink of the wine of the wrath of God as we saw in Revelation 14. But before the angels can pour out their judgments, look what we see next. There's this beautiful kind of an interlude, right? It's kind of the calm before the final storm. Look what he writes in verse 2. John says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So John again sees that same scene of the heavenly throne room, just like we saw, remember, back in chapter 4. He sees that same sea that we read about in chapter 4. It said, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And remember, we saw that the sea was designed to reflect the glory of God up there on his throne. It's kind of like if you think about a mountain lake, you know, and how beautifully still they can be so that when you look at it on a clear day, it's the most beautiful thing because you see all of the mountain peaks that are surrounding it. You see that those peaks reflected in that lake. And if the mountains maybe are covered with snow, then you see that snow there in the reflection but suppose if those mountains were covered with burning fire all around those mountain tops, then you would see that burning fire then reflected there in that lake. And that's the sense of what's being spoken of here, this sea of glass mingled now with fire. It's probably a sign of God's purifying judgment that's there on his throne. It's about to come from his throne upon the world, and it's now being reflected there in that beautiful still sea. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that our God is a consuming fire, and it is finally time for that fire to finally consume all of this wickedness that man has been heaping up in this world. Now, 
as interesting as I think as the sea is and this reflection of these fires of judgment, just as interesting I think is this group that we see standing upon the sea. Right? It says those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. Now, we've seen this group before. Remember back in chapter 7, these are those who we would call tribulation saints. They're different from the 144,000 who made it through the tribulation. These are those who come to faith during the tribulation, right? After the church has been raptured to heaven and they were very likely martyred during the tribulation because, as it says here, they would not bow down to the beast. They wouldn't take the mark of the beast. They wouldn't take part in that whole ungodly system that's gonna fill the world during that time. And notice, that from heaven's perspective, they have victory even in their death. And it's interesting, the more you read of the early church, the writings of the early church fathers and the history of the early church, you see that consistently, they always described the day that a Christian was martyred as a day of victory for that individual. At the Antichrist, he'll be able to kill their bodies, but he will not be able to kill their souls. And so here they stand before the throne of God on the sea of glass with this tremendous testimony of victory. And I love the picture because I think it's such an important reminder in our own lives and in our ministries, in our marriages, you know, in the struggles and the trials that we go through, that victory looks very, very different from the perspective of heaven. Victory isn't necessarily about where we finally end up, but more so it's about how we got there. And so these saints, saints stood here in victory there in heaven because they stood on the word of God while they were on earth. And incidentally, that's precisely what many believe is pictured here for us by the sea of glass. Now remember, we know that the Bible tells us that this heavenly scene of the throne of God and the, the temple of God, it's the heavenly reality that the earthly representations of the tabernacle and the temple are meant to mirror, right? They were both built here on earth according to the pattern of what actually exists up there in heaven. And one of the elements that we find in the layout, both of the tabernacle and then later the temple, is this big kind of a pool of water that was called the bronze laver. And it actually stood outside of the Holy of Holies, outside the holy place. It stood out in the courtyard. And this big laver full of this crystal clear kind of pool of water was to be used in the tabernacle and then later in the temple services. It was for the washing and for the purification of the priests. And it's very interesting, I think, that Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, he talks about that reality of the washing of the water by the word of God, which is what cleanses us as believers. And so in this sense, we could very rightly say that this pool of water for washing that's found here in the tabernacle and in the temple is a picture for us of the word of God. And so this, these tribulation saints that we see here are standing on that word of God. Now, didn't it seem odd at first glance when you read that they were standing on a sea? Well, now we see that it's not such a strange thing to see at all, is it? Because the image for us is that they're standing on the word of God. It's a beautiful picture. It's such an important reminder for us as believers to stay standing on the word of God, even in the face of the judgment that we might face from the world. Because when we do, just like these saints, we stand in victory. We also stand in a posture of worship. Because notice that these saints here, they all have these harps. Apparently they're just giving these harps away up in heaven, right? So that they can join in with this heavenly worship of God. Look what it says in verse three. It says that they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb. 
saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Now this is great, because remember back in the last chapter, the 144,000, we saw that they sang a new song that it said that nobody else could sing. So here we have a different song being sung by these tribulation saints. They're singing this song here on the sea, and it's one song that has been sung before, but it has two different titles, right? It's the song of Moses and it's the song of the Lamb. And they both speak of a very similar reality in this beautiful kind of a union between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. They both speak of God's redemption of all of his people. The reference here when it's talked about being the song of Moses, it's a reference to that song that Moses sang to the children of Israel at the Red Sea and it's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 15. And you remember that following that miraculous deliverance from bondage and then the equally miraculous deliverance from and then the destruction of the entire pursuing army of Pharaoh who were trying to take them back into bondage again and they finally get through the Red Sea and then Moses sings in Exodus 15. He says, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. And then Moses continues for another 16 verses just beautifully detailing the work of God on behalf of his people. So it's a song of celebration and redemption. It celebrates God's deliverance from the wickedness of Egypt and from that time of bondage in Egypt. And remember before they got through, remember when the army of Pharaoh was bearing down on Moses and on the children of Israel, it looked like their deliverance out of Egypt was gonna be very short-lived, right? It looked like they were about to be captured and taken back into that horrible system of bondage. And you remember that Moses stops the people as the army's approaching. And even before the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, he says, this to the people in chapter 14 of Exodus starting in verse 13 it says that Moses said to the people do not be afraid stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today for the Egyptians whom you see today you shall see again no more forever the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace so Moses says, hey, look at those people. Look at those people that are coming towards us. It would have been a horde of the army, right? He says, take a look at these people. Take a good, hard, long look at these people because you will never, ever see them again. This army that's bearing down on them and that was so threatening to them, Moses promises they will never, ever be able to hurt you again. And of course, it was all absolutely true. Because moments later, the entire army of Pharaoh was swallowed up and drowned in the Red Sea. And so the song of Moses that he sings, it is such a wonderful song of deliverance and of redemption. But this same song that the tribulation saints will sing is called the song of the Lamb because the song of Moses is just a shadow of a much greater redemption and a much greater deliverance that we all enjoy in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, in the scriptures, of course, Egypt is a type of the world. Pharaoh is a type of the devil. Moses is a type of Jesus. And Jesus both redeemed us from the world and he has delivered us from the devil. And these tribulation saints who sing this song, they could celebrate the fact that despite all the horror that they had just been through in the world during the tribulation, neither the world nor the devil would ever be able 
to use them again or abuse them again or to persecute or to torment them ever again. All of that was over. That's what this song is about in heaven. Right? Look at those people. You will never see them again. You will never know again what you just went through during your terrible time of tribulation ever again. And that is a song also, in a very real sense, that we can sing right along with them. Right? The song of Moses celebrated God's redemption of his people from the slavery in Egypt. The song of the Lamb celebrates our final deliverance from Satan and all of his foes that come against us in the spiritual realm. And I love the way that one author put it. He says that these two songs mark the two bounds of redemption history and between them lies the whole history of God's ransomed people. And the song is such a beautiful one. It just celebrates God for who he is. Look back at verses three and four with me. Notice that it's a celebration of his works and his ways and of his worthiness and of our worship of him for all of it. And can I just say that, as an aside, that God is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our worship every day, all day, each day. He's worthy of it whether we feel like worshiping him or whether we don't. Right? Because we worship the Lord not because of how we feel in that moment, but we worship him simply because he is worthy of it. And these martyrs, notice that they are only focused on God. Right? Look at the words that they use. Your works, your ways, you know, you, O oh Lord, your name, you alone, worship before you. They talk about your judgments, right? All of their worship was solely focused on him. They weren't focused at all on the, the horrific hell that they had just lived through on earth. They weren't focused on how it was that they got to this glorious place of victory. They were focused on the Lord. Now, it is absolutely appropriate for us to examine our own hearts, Right? As we come before the Lord in worship and as we reflect on where we are. But that should never be the focus of our worship experience. Right? When we worship, we should be focused on the one that we worship. We should be focused on God alone, not on ourselves. And sometimes you can start to kind of see a pattern in some of the worship choruses you see how solely self-reflective they are and how very self-focused they are. And some of these worship songs just become all about me and how I'm feeling and what it is that I need. And of course, there is a, a place for that, but it's really a matter of having it in the right proportion, right? And the right proportion to the honor and credit and the focus all belongs to God because it's all about him. It's not at all about us. And that may sound harsh, but really, if we're honest, it is such a freeing thing to realize in our lives. It's freeing to realize that it is not about us, but it is all about him. And to put our focus back there where it belongs on a much better subject. Right? His works, they're great and marvelous. His ways, it says, are just and true. There's this wonderful celebration of his holiness there in verse 4. It produces this sense of fear and this sense of awe and reverence related to him. And that produces, look at the end of verse 4, that produces even a celebration of his judgments. Because it's these judgments which are about to come which heaven knows are going to finally bring an end to the wickedness and to the rebellion of mankind. Now, it is too bad that it takes that to accomplish that. It's too bad that love wouldn't do that. Right? It's too bad that the cross didn't do that. Now, the cross had the power to do that. Right? Love has the power to do that. But man's heart is so exceedingly wicked 
that mankind as a human race will not respond to those other things. And so what we have done is we have forced God into that place where God then must mete out judgment to bring an end to all of this wickedness and this rebellion on the earth. And you notice that when that finally happens, in this song, there is not one single complaint. There's not one single question of God. Nobody in heaven is going to complain when that judgment is poured out on the earth. And instead, it is the righteousness and it's the trueness and the purity and it's the white hot holiness of God's judgment that that's what's going to be celebrated in heaven. Heaven collectively says, okay, enough is enough, enough. We want to see you bring an end to this terrible thing that man has created in his rebellion and what he has turned your creation and what he has turned the world into apart from that righteous standard of your law. And look at what John writes next. Right? The next thing John sees is a testimony to exactly that. It's a testimony to holiness in heaven. In verse 5, he says that after these things I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Right? So from the saints that he sees singing there on the sea before the throne of God, John next sees the, the heavenly sanctuary opened up completely to him so that effectively he can see inside the Holy of Holies. At that place where God dwelt, where the Ark of the Covenant sat. And remember that what John saw then and what we're reading about now in this verse, that is the heavenly reality of the earthly copy. And when he speaks here specifically about the testimony, it's a reference to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments which were kept there inside of the Ark of the Covenant, inside of the Holy of Holies. And as it's now opened up and the Spirit directs John's attention to that testimony, the idea that John is communicating here to us is that God is about to apply the standard of his commandments in his word. He's going to apply that to the wickedness in the world. And the result of that is going to be judgment. The result of that is producing wrath, right? You simply take his Ten Commandments as the basis of his law and you lay it alongside of the moral and the spiritual bankruptness, bankruptcy, the bankrupt, whatever. We're moral and we're spiritually bankrupt. And when you lay God's standard alongside that, then you, you consider what's demanded in the law of the unrighteousness of man, the consequences for violating the law, and all of that is about to be brought to bear on the earth as a result of this judgment that God's been forced into. And it all comes from this pure, undefiled righteousness and holiness of God. People don't like to hear this today. You may not like to hear this today, but there is a right and there is a wrong in this universe. There's hardly a right or wrong today in the world. There's hardly a right or wrong today in our country. But can you imagine, can you imagine for a moment what God sees just in this country? Can you imagine what God sees happening in this world on any given day? What God has to watch happen. And all you have to do is turn on the news for a moment and you have all the evidence that you need in order to come to the conclusion that man is incapable of governing himself and that left unto himself Man is thoroughly wicked. And I don't need to run through a bunch of horrible headlines and examples for us all to know that that's true. But it is almost, at times, it is incomprehensible to see the atrocities that man is capable of committing against one another. Not to mention the immorality that now just characterizes most modern societies and certainly characterizes our current culture, it is absolutely an affront 
to God. Now, I'm no goody two-shoes, right? And there are many of us in this room who lived enough life, you know, before we were rescued by the Lord. But when you start and you just start to take sin further and to push sin further until it is just an affront to any kind of human sensitivity, and then you imagine that we're all just getting used to it. Right. Realistically, the things that would have been absolutely rejected even just 50 years ago are now being not just embraced, but they're being celebrated. Even though they are clearly and expressly forbidden and they're warned against repeatedly in God's word, imagine what God, in the absolute holiness of heaven, imagine what he feels and imagine what he sees and imagine the wrath that is building towards all of this as we just continue to get more and more comfortable with all of it, right? Atrocities, immorality, and of course, not even to mention cor corruption. You think about it, God knows every single thing that has gone on in every single you know, board meeting of every single company in the world. God knows what goes on behind those closed doors of all of the government meetings, right? All those decisions that are made in the darkness and in secret. God sees all of it. And he's going to eventually take his righteousness and apply the holiness of his word against all of it. And when he does, it is just going to sizzle, right? It is going to absolutely sizzle when it gets laid there on that. There is a right and there is a wrong. And don't ever, ever forget that because there is no confusion over that fact up in heaven. Heaven knows that there's a difference. And anyone who makes this book the Bible, right? Any one of us who makes this the single great influence on our life, we will never, ever forget that. There is a good, there is a bad, there is a right, there is a wrong, and they are not open to be redefined. And God knows what he's doing in bringing judgment against it, right? We don't see any crying out against him here. This is simply him. What we're going to see in these next chapters is just him being righteous and true and being holy, right? That his word is going to cause this judgment to be poured out. By this point in the tribulation, remember that the earthly temple is defiled, right? Again, by the Antichrist. But the temple in heaven is completely unaffected. It remains holy it remains pure. It remains this beautiful standard of God's word. And that standard is going to come out on the earth. And it's going to be characterized by judgment. And the very next thing that John sees here, look at verse 6. It says that out of that temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. So these are the agents of God's holy judgment, they're his holy angels. And they come here out of the temple, right out of the presence of God, right? These are angels that have been around the throne of God. They're special emissaries of God. Look, they're clothed in these pure, bright linens. They have these golden bands, right? It all speaks of purity and of royalty and of strength and of holiness. And what they're wearing reminds us, doesn't it, of the priestly garments, in the Old Testament, because again, their service was a, a divine ministry, right? They're representing the Lord. Look what we see next in verse 7. It says in verse 7 that then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So here in our scene, we've got one of the four living creatures who remember when we saw them uh, before, back in chapter 4, we talked about the fact that these four living creatures are representative of the whole of creation. So one of these creatures actually hands the bowls of the wrath of God to the angels who will be the ones to deliver it. So you can read this and you kind of feel the tension rising in heaven. Now we've got bowls that are full of the wrath of God. Now, 
If you're here and you use the old King James Version, first of all, you're much smarter than the rest of us. But if you use the old King James Version, which is normally a beautiful translation, but it says in this verse that the angels had seven golden vials of the wrath of God. Now, in all honesty, vials is really not a great translation in this case. More accurately, one Greek linguist says that what's really being described are shallow, pan-like golden bowls or censers such as were used in the temple to hold the fire when incense was burned. Now that certainly seems to make more sense in the context of this scene, right? We're talking about these big saucers almost that are overflowing with the wrath of God. I just, maybe I've watched too many Disney movies with my girls, but you kind of think of some kind of a bubbling potion, right, that's spilling over the sides and there's steam coming up, right? And here these angels are about to go and pour out this bubbling hot judgment out on the world. And you can bet we're going to see that when that judgment finally does come out of these bowls, it comes out fast, Right? It's going to come like sloshing over the sides of these bowls, not like dripping out drop by drop out of a small vial. Now, I don't know if you've noticed what's happening here. As we have been working our way through these seven short verses, right here we're pausing to prepare for the judgment of God. And we have been reminded of the holiness of God and of the righteousness of God by every different group in every place in heaven in every verse that we've looked at. First of all, by the martyrs in verses two through four, then by God's law itself in verse five, then by the angels in verse six, and then finally in creation there in verse seven. All reminding us that God is holy and God is righteous and God is true. And then finally in our final verse we see that the Lord himself also will testify of his own holiness. In verse 8 it says that the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. You talk about a breathtaking moment. I mean, in the literal sense of taking your breath away. When these bowls are finally handed to the seven angels, right, that Shekinah glory of God himself completely fills the temple in the in heavenly sanctuary so that no one, it says, can come in, no one can go out whatsoever until these plagues have been accomplished. And it reminds us, of course, of two great events in the Old Testament where the same thing happened, right? At the first dedication of the tabernacle by Moses in Exodus chapter 40. Remember when God's glory came so great on the tabernacle that it said that no one else could be ministering inside during that time. Then it happened again in the dedication of the temple by King Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 when that very same thing happened. And in both those places, it's representation of the very presence of God. The very glory of his divine presence as he chose then to dwell there in the midst of his people. But there is one thing that's different here than we saw there in either of those two other events in the Old Testament, right? As the, the presence of God was manifested. One thing is different here and that's smoke. This time we see that mixed in here with that pure Shekinah glory of God, we have smoke, right? A symbol, of course, of judgment. And then we see that the doors to the heavenly temple effectively are sealed shut, right? It's filled with smoke as a sign that this judgment is now irreversible. At this moment, God says, there is no priest, there is no angel, there is no anyone or anything that can come now into the Holy of Holies and change my mind about this judgment that will finally bring an end to this horrible rebellion. At 
this point, the nations are beyond intercession and God's long suffering will come to an end. Now, as we close this morning, there are some people who would speculate that the reason here that the doors are sort of shut, locked by God at this time is because God is actually weeping there inside the temple, right? At the, weeping at the finality of his judgment as it's poured out finally upon the earth. Now, I don't know about that, but I will say it wouldn't surprise me at all. But we don't know. But what we do know is that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He does not enjoy it one single bit. He doesn't enjoy the death of one single unrighteous person. We've mentioned it before, but remember in Ezekiel chapter 33, the Lord spoke through Ezekiel, told him to tell the children of Israel, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? It is absolutely heartbreaking to him. Again, imagine God. He's created the heavens and the earth. He then creates men and women to have fellowship with him and so that he could pour out his love upon them. And here instead, man in his rebellion, he has forced God into the position of being the judge that he never ever wanted to be in any single person's life. God wants to be our loving Heavenly Father. He wants to be, he's willing to be our Savior, but he doesn't want to be their judge. And yet it was so important to him to give every person their own free will so that they could choose whether or not they wanted to respond to his love because that's the only way that it's a valid choice. So chapter 15, I think, is so important. Right? Eight little verses, but they remind us that we as a human race have forced God's hand. We have forced him to judge us. And it's this reminder strategically placed here before we see these bowls poured out. It is a reminder that God is righteous and that he is holy and that his judgments, as hard as they are to watch, they are right and they are true just like he is. And it's such an important thing to keep in mind, but not only as we continue on in this book, but it's critical that we keep that in mind just as we continue on in our own lives. As we continue on in our walk with the Lord, it's so easy that we doubt his decisions or we can question his actions or we wonder about his inaction maybe in our lives. Why didn't you come through for me, God? Why haven't you answered that prayer for me, God? But we need to remember that he is always operating from a place of his goodness and from his place of his grace and from a place of his holiness and of his wisdom. And we need to trust that the creator knows what's best for the creation. And that's why we have the cross. So if you think that it's unfair that God would judge the wicked, remember that he has provided a way where no one would ever have to be judged. And he provided that way, of course, when he took that judgment upon himself so that no person would ever, ever have to. That's the God that we serve. That's the God who we're going to see forced into bringing judgment. That's the God who has saved most of us here this morning. Amen? Let's pray. So Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we thank you for this, um, this brief chapter, Lord, and yet we, we're so thankful for the message that it delivers, Lord. We, we know that in your wisdom you have placed it here in this place just to prepare us and to prepare our hearts for what it is that we're going to have to watch um, 
come upon this world. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the cross of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for your willingness to send your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, Lord, but should have eternal life. Lord, and we, we look forward now to celebrating that even today, Lord, through our time of baptism. Lord, in that beautiful picture of, of the way that we have died to our sins, Lord, we have been resurrected to new eternal life in you, Lord. The old things have passed away and all things have become new. And so we thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in each one of us. We thank you for your word as it encourages us, Lord. And we thank you and we do praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.